What up, meatheads? This is Travis, American Butcher, and this is the Meat Blog Podcast. This is a weekly podcast where we go kind of in-depth or maybe not that in-depth into a topic in the meat industry or butchering or maybe vague charcuterie culinary. So this is the podcast created by David, Ryan, and myself, and we're all three um, butchers, meat cutters. We've all worked in custom exempt, and we've all worked slaughter, and we've all worked retail. Now, I'm not saying we're experts in this industry by any means, uh, but we do have a lot of knowledge, and we have a lot of applied knowledge. So that's what this podcast is, is to share our experiences and knowledge and stories and anecdotes and give advice and give you facts and whatever. And in this week's episode, we're talking about health, physical health in our industry. Good cutting enhances the quality of good meat. In his way, the meat cutter is an artist. Poor cutting results in an inferior piece of meat, regardless of quality. Bunzel Processor Division has been in the food, processing, and packaging industry for over 135 years, offering over 35,000 of high-quality products designed specifically to meet the needs of the meat processing, butchery, food processing, and janitorial industrial industries. Bunzel Processor Division also specializes in packaging equipment and supplies, offering the Multivac P-Series line of chamber packaging machines as well as the Clarity line of shrink bags, roll stock film, and vacuum pouches. They have numerous product experts and outstanding customer service. And let's not forget, free UPS ground shipping on all orders over $400 or more. That's BunzelPD.com. Once again, that's BunzelPD.com. I remember first starting out in this industry, just being younger, not young by the means of most people when they start out in this industry, like Simon, who I think his mom swallowed a knife and he cut himself out. He's telling me how long he's been in this industry. So I could only imagine the aches and pains that someone like him has. But when I was first starting out in this industry, I remember I was cropping about 1,500 birds every Friday. And if you don't know what cropping is, you got to release their their crop, got to cut up the, the neck of them without cutting too deep in the skin on the breast. And then you use your index finger and you like push in and pull out the crop. So when they draw a bird, which drawing a bird is essentially eviscerating a bird, uh, it's easier to come out and the inspector could pull it out in one go or the line worker or whatever. This was just one of many jobs that I had in this time in my life, uh, working in a USDA meat slaughter packing facility. And I used to hate cropping birds because even with wearing gloves and then a uh, cotton glove underneath, the tips of your fingers were just get so raw and like just from pressing and pressing and you'd end up getting bones stabbing you through all your gloves and stabbing you underneath the fingernails to the point where I would take pieces of cardboard and wrap them around the tips of my fingers to prevent this, or pieces of paper towel or something to add a little bit extra cushion. We'd do this for about, you know, I, or I would do this for about eight hours every Friday, and then the rest of the week would be back to just general slaughter work where you're, you're just pushing around dead weight. And I was used to my body feeling sore and feeling the effects of a hard day's work, and I never complained about that. But what I was not used to was waking up in the middle of the night for the first time with my hands numb, but still somehow in pain, like excruciating dull pain, like an ache that persists. The next day I go to work and I'm talking to this old timer, John Steins. He helped train me when I eventually moved to the cut room. I told him about my hands and his reaction to me was, Travis, if I were to complain about how much my body hurts, I would never shut the fuck up. And I, and I picked up what he was saying, that he didn't really want to hear about me complaining about being sore when I'm in my 20s and I'm 
relatively fresh in this industry when he was a fourth generation slaughterman butcher who was well into his 50s, which triggered something in me that more or less this is something that we you don't talk about. If you feel pain, man up and work through it. I adopted this. I adopted the attitude that, you know, if you're working a 14 hour shift and someone starts complaining about aches and pains or being tired, that that's the first person you send home because that attitude is more mental and it's going to spread into your staff. Now, knowing that this was the attitude of the shop or the slaughter facility I was working at at the time, I adopted the worth ethic that just keep your mouth shut and work harder than everyone else and never complain. The carpal tunnel would come and go. I would sleep with the tennis ball in my hand sometimes to help the pain. Then I would take Ambien that would just make me not even wake up or realize that I was in pain in the night anyway. Then I started getting tendonitis. It would start at my wrist, move up my forearm, and hit my shoulder. This would happen for about a week, every three months or so. I would wrap my wrist, then compress my forearm, and then ice my shoulder. I would look around the cut block at the old timers, because about this time I was in the cut room. And about every other person had their wrist wrapped with vet wrap, which is a ace bandage elastic wrap that I still use to this day when it flares up. You want to make sure you buy the vet wrap, though. The ones that's for horses, they may be it may be pink, camo, or may have a slogan saying, don't chew, but it is a lot cheaper than the ace bandage kind. I was talking across the block with this old cutter, Jerry, and he got the carpal tunnel surgery. And I asked him how it was uh, expressing that I had pain in my hands. And he told me he wouldn't recommend it because the relief wasn't worth the, the surgery, that it didn't do enough or his expectations. But on the other hand, my mom got carpal tunnel surgery for, uh, she used to do a lot of computer work and typing in the 90s. And she recommends it. So I guess there's mixed reviews. I also wasn't the most healthy individual at this time. I was guzzling about four, five rock stars a day or monster energy drinks or fuel, whatever one was the cheapest that I could buy that particular day that I went shopping. I smoked two packs of Camel Lights a day and chewed about a can of Grizzly, which if you've ever chewed Grizzly, it's like chewing fiberglass. And to quote Robert Earl Keane, this regimen of bad behavior kept me free from worms and long relationships. I was making shit money. So I was buying shit food, stuff that was high in sugar that would give you like boosts of energy. I didn't, I wasn't aware of healthy eating. I wasn't woke on the scale that I am as far as physical health. I would eat chips. I'd eat things full of carbs that were just cheap to make and cheap to buy. Then I got offered a job in my home state of California, and I moved from Vermont to Hollywood. This next piece is by David. Hey, gang. David here. I'm sure we've all worked with uh, that kind of old timer that tells you, oh, butchering's a young man's game, or... I used to be a butcher, but now I'm not because of the nerve pensions. Or, you know, somebody you currently work with that has carpal tunnel or numbness or tingling or arthritis in their knees, hands, elbows, neck, um, frequent headaches, things like that. Just kind of typical ailments that you hear about around the shop. I've always thought of myself as kind of immune to these things. Um stupidly due to what I consider to be a conscientious diet and healthier life choices, things like that. Just kind of general self-righteousness. Um, karma's a bitch though. And over the last year and a half, I've started to exhibit some of these symptoms and various ailments that, that people generally complain about in the shop. The first of which, um, 
Happened about a month and a half ago. I woke up in the middle of the night and both of my hands were numb and somehow simultaneously aching. I couldn't believe how bad they hurt. And it pretty much kept me awake the rest of the night. That kind of progressed into aching all the time and pins and needles and a little bit of numbness in my left hand during the day at work. And then continued to develop into both thumbs and um, pointer and middle fingers and both hands going numb. But it was really seemed to be prevalent in the left hand. Even more recently, I got done with my work on Friday, went home, went to bed, and then couldn't make a fist until Monday morning. I was concerned um, because I noticed that these symptoms were really more prevalent in my left hand. And so I was kind of left thinking, you know, and worrying about something to do with my heart or circulation or even diabetes. I didn't really have good info on neuropathy or anything like that. So it just became something that I was trying to ignore, but was kind of secretly worried about. I mean, what would happen if I couldn't use my hands anymore? Butcher with no hands is, I think, a person without a job. I talked to people around the shop and had gotten various forms of advice from cannabis oil to eating more bananas to wrist braces and all kinds of different things. I decided to look into it for myself, see if I could get any sort of concrete info. It seems as if it's probably carpal tunnel. And from what I could find, carpal tunnel is a type of nerve entrapment condition or a major compression of the um, the median nerve in the wrist. The carpal tunnel itself is a narrow tube or passageway on the inner wrist consisting of a combination of ligaments and bone. They make up this small tube that allows nine tendons and one large nerve to contract and expand through, and that controls your fingers and sends the communication between your brain and your hands as far as touch and um, various other things. Some of the earliest symptoms that you'll encounter when you get carpal tunnel are numb thumbs, uh, light tingling, pins and needles, and then it kind of progresses into burning, um, severe pain, keeping you up at night. And it seems kind of mysterious to me. Why, why is it more prevalent at night? You know, I always thought that nighttime was when our body was supposed to restore itself and repair things. But it really seemed like these carpal tunnel symptoms were amplified at night by quite a bit. I mean, I'd wake up and sometimes it would keep me awake, just the numbness and the aching. From what I could find on the internet, there's a few factors that work against you when you're sleeping. First of all, the fact is simply that our circulation is lower than um, when we're awake while we're sleeping. Just because it doesn't need to be as high. You know, we're in this kind of hibernation state. And so the inflammation of the carpal tunnel itself really makes that worse. It constricts the the, uh, blood flow even more. So slowing down something that's already slow really contributes to the poor circulation and the the dead feeling in your hands when you wake up at night. Secondly, we're kind of in a state of semi-paralysis while we're sleeping. This lack of muscle movement makes it impossible for our lymphatic systems to disperse swelling as muscle contractions act as the lymph system's pump. So the lymphatic system, unlike the circulatory system, which has the heart as a dedicated pump, The lymphatic system doesn't have a pump like that, so it just kind of relies on the contractions and expansions of our muscles to create that pump effect, moving liquid in and liquid out um, for different uses. The lymphatic system's primary job, it seems, is to act as the body's drainage system, you know, um, and that includes draining inflammation. Another thing that makes it hurt so much at night is during the day, you're, you've got this constricted sheath for these tendons. 
and it's rubbing and rubbing and rubbing as you use them, and they just become inflamed. And at night, you really oftentimes sleep in such a way that, or at least I do, where my wrist is bent, and that bending causes pressure in that in that tunnel, which creates more inflammation. So you really get no reprieve from this whatsoever. One thing that really um, confused me or, or caused concern was the prevalence of these symptoms in my left hand. Why is it so much worse in my left hand all the time when my right hand is my knife hand? You know, I mean, oftentimes I've got a death grip on my knife and, and, uh, not all the time, but sometimes, and it seems like that would be where the most pain is. But as it turns out, um, there's something called left sided carpal tunnel syndrome specific to butchers. After doing a little bit of digging on the internet, trying to figure out this left hand thing, I came across this super esoteric transcript of a study that was featured in the Scandinavian Journal of Work, Environment, and Health in July of 1983. Um, The research paper itself is a very heady and difficult to follow without a medical degree paper. However, a summary was provided along with it, which is great. The summary says... The butchers from two slaughterhouses were studied for carpal tunnel syndrome. The diagnosis was based on subjective symptoms. And in about half of the otherwise healthy butchers, there were various degrees of the syndrome in the non-dominant hand. Or, if the syndrome was bilateral, the non-dominant side was more affected. So far, uh, the operative findings and results were consistent with carpal tunnel syndrome. The underlying cause for the occupational disorder is probably mechanical stress on the left hand. Various tools are held in the right hand while the carcass is lifted, torn, handled, and whatnot with the left hand. The butchers considered the load on the left to be more strenuous than the one on the right. The prolonged heavy grasping with the fingers of the left hand probably leads to the thickening of the synovial membrane of the finger flexors with the carpal tunnel. The carpal tunnel is a relatively rigid structure, and an increased diameter of the flexor tendons may cause the carpal tunnel syndrome. So who knew? I mean, that's why it's worse than my left hand is because I'm constantly ripping and tearing and trying to put pressure on and separating seams with one hand, and um, that's my left one. And I guess I'm not really doing all that much with my right hand, so one thought is to use a boning hook more often than I do. You know, I see people that are just lightning fast with those things, but I never take the time to really use them, really practice with them. You're probably asking yourself, what can I do at this point? Um, There are things. You know, you're not just totally screwed if you get carpal tunnel. There are various treatments, surgeries, medications, things like that, but there's, there's a few things that are pretty cheap and pretty easy that we can work into our routine and I think may work. Uh, These are according to the... um, the American Arthritis Association. First of all, make sure you're standing up straight. If you're anything like me, most cutting tables are too short for you, you know, so I default to slouching while looking down and cutting, usually. This rolls my shoulders forward, um, creating kind of an avalanche of problems, such as muscle shortening, pinching of nerves and shoulders and necks, uh, you know, bothering circulation, Things like that. So my suggestion, and something I'm going to try to do myself, is to try to raise my block up or train myself to stand more straight. And I know that it's a lot more realistic to raise the butcher block up than it is to train myself to stay straight. I mean, I kind of hunch naturally anyways at times. And so um, I think it would be a lot easier just to raise it up. Try to relax your knife grip. That's another one. You know, even though it's more prevalent in the left hand in a lot of places, it wouldn't be hurt to uh, to not have the death grip on your knife all the time. I think cutters who use a boning hook probably are at an advantage because they don't have to strain quite as much uh, with their left hand. And on the right hand, you see a lot of butchers in videos that it seems like they, they just barely have the knife in their hands, just enough to guide it, you know, and it's doing all the work. Remember, wrist posture is important, too. You know, you don't want... If you could keep your wrist straight all the time while you cut, you'd be a lot better off than when 
you have it at, at an extreme angle. This probably seems somewhat unrealistic, but stretching it breaks before and after work um, early in the morning. You know, I, I stretch a lot in the shower in the morning, and I always stretch on my breaks on my lunch. You can look up online a whole bunch of different stretches that, that people suggest, um, but the one that I do is I just kind of make a fist and then slowly curl my fingers out and then stretch them as far as I can apart and just do that 10 times each hand. Another one that we'll touch on a little bit later um, is to, inv you know, try to inv avoid inflammatory foods um, or being like super hungover and dehydrated at work. Dehydration is a major source of inflammation and uh, so is booze, you know. Last but not least, there's some braces. Now, there's these braces that you can buy for pretty cheap. I think that I saw... Um, I saw them for about 10 bucks a piece at the local pharmacy and it's just kind of a lace up rigid brace that keeps your wrist straight while you're sleeping. And I guess it really helps during the day too, if you, if you get, uh, really serious about wearing them at night. Another nuisance of a condition that has gotten in the way of my path to happy cutting is a real classic son of a bitch. It goes by the name of gout. I'm sure some of the older cutters in your shop have it. It generally affects, um, disproportionately affects older men than it does anybody else. But I got it at a young age, I think, probably because of my the rich diet that I've always went after. <clears throat> I drank a bit of beer now and again in my, uh, in my earlier 20s as well. Gout's a type of arthritis um, that some people get due to an elevated level of uric acid in the blood. The acid exists in the form of needle-like crystals that, when concentrated enough, form little bottlenecks of torture in whatever one of your joints that it damn well pleases. Most people get it in their feet, specifically in the knuckle of their big toe, which makes 12-hour shifts on concrete agonizing. It just so happy uh, happens that I'm lucky enough to get it in my elbows. When I have a flare-up, I can't make a fist or grip a knife at all. The attack is characterized by intense pain, tenderness, fever, swelling, hotness of the joint, redness, and inflexibility. Has anybody out there got gout? I think it's kind of, a, kind of an older disease. Not a lot of young people have it anymore, but I, I sure as shit get it. I've been told by uh, conventional doctors family members, and naturopaths that gout is extremely avoidable by adjusting diet. But what's the connection, though? According to the American Arthritis Foundation, too much uric acid in your body is what causes gout. Most of your uric acid, about two-thirds, is produced by your body naturally. The rest comes from your diet, however, often in the form of purines. Purines are substances in animal and plant foods that your body converts into uric acid. If you can't flush the uric acid out through your kidneys, it can get built up in the bloodstream and deposited as needle-shaped crystals in your joints. These crystals cause the severe inflammation and, and, and intense pain of a gout attack. People who follow even the strictest low-purine diet will reduce their uric acid levels by only a small amount. For a person not taking um, uric acid lowering medication from their doctor, a more restricted diet can decrease the number of food trigger flares they have. If patients cut back on beer binges and shrimp boils, it'll cut down on the number of flares they have, but it's not going to cure their gout, according to Dr. Uh, Randall Edwards. So what are some foods that are low in purines? What are some foods that are high in purines? Here's a list given to me by my friend Deb, who has a background in nutrition and naturopathic health. She gave me kind of a spectrum of uh, alkalinity and acidity and where certain foods land on each. So I'll just give you a, a good idea of what's on here. So for high alkaline foods, now they're high alkaline, so they're, um, they're safe for people with a predisposition to having high uric acid levels or gout. High alkaline foods include vegetables um, of different kinds, parsley, spinach, 
broccoli, celery, garlic, barley, dried figs, raisins, herbal teas, lemon water, stevia. Now, those are the really high alkaline foods. Some of the average alkaline foods are carrots, green beans, beets, lettuce, zucchini, carob, currants, dates, grapes, papaya, kiwi, apples, pears, breast milk, hazelnut, almond, green tea, and for sweeteners, maple syrup and rice syrup. Now, a low alkaline food, you're still, you're still on the alkaline side, but it's just closer to neutral. Some of these are squash, asparagus, rhubarb, fresh corn, mushrooms, onions, cabbage, peas, cauliflower, turnip, um, sour cherries, tomatoes, oranges, avocados, strawberries, lentils, rice, quinoa, millet, buckwheat, goat milk, goat cheese, buttermilk and whey, chestnuts, olive oil, and as far as sweeteners go, raw honey and raw sugar. Now, the rest of these are on the acid to high acid list. So these are things that are just going to throw you right into a gout attack if you if you're predisposed. And it's true, you know. I mean, if I go on a binge for these thing with these things, um, I notice swelling and and even just low level pain, just kind of oscillating in my elbows. It also just so happens that these uh, foods make up almost all of my diet. Pinto beans, navy beans, white rice, white bread, pastries, biscuits, pasta, fish, turkey, chicken, lamb, beef, pork, veal, shellfish, canned tuna, and sardines, eggs, parmesan, peanuts, cashews, uh, <laughs> milk, chocolate, brown sugar, molasses, jam, ketchup, mayonnaise, mustard, vinegar, coffee, beer, and liquor. So, uh, it's pretty much my entire diet on the acidic end. And, you know, while I would think that meat would be the thing that I'd miss most if I had to cut out of my diet, the truth is it's, it's fucking peanuts. I love peanut butter more than anything in the entire world. That's a fact. I love it. I'll eat an entire jar in two days, no problem. And I think the peanuts are a huge contributing factor to my gout. So, um... Now, if you can't avoid these foods, if you can't change your diet, what are some things you could do if you have an attack? And, you know, sometimes even if you're doing really well, you still have attacks and there's nothing you can do and you can't beat yourself up about it. I have one standby treatment. Well, I guess I guess it's two, but they're used in conjunction and they're guaranteed to work. Um, they will present other issues, but they will get rid of the gout. And so... My suggestion is go to the store and get yourself, if you're in the middle of an acute gout, uh, an acute gout attack, go to, go to the grocery, uh, grab yourself three 32-ounce bottles of tart cherry juice. Not a cocktail, just 100% tart cherry juice. Black cherry juice will work in a bind. It's a shit ton more sugar, though, and uh, you know it can, you can really feel it. Take this juice, slug one of them right away. I mean, like after, like while you're paying for it, drink a 32 ounce bottle of tart cherry juice, and then over the next couple hours, sip another one of the quarts while you're sipping on a gallon of water. You really want to get that water through you. Now, at this point, it's not unreasonable for a person to shit themselves. So you know. If you're in the middle of an acute gout attack and you have to resort to the cherry juice method, just make sure that you're close to a bathroom. It's not something you can do while you're at work. Um, unless you want to invest in like a stadium buddy, a device that David Sedaris introduced um, to help you from having to go to the bathroom to go to the bathroom. Anyways, uh, so you've slugged your first 32-ounce bottle of cherry juice. You're sipping the second one while drinking lots and lots of water, at least a gallon. And then the next day, you're going to slug another bottle of cherry juice. And by that time, 
you should be able to, to uh, feel it break up a little bit. The potassium, I've been told, is what breaks up the purines and the uric acid. So sometimes late a banana, you know, but really the cherry juice is, is the miracle thing for an, uh, an acute gout attack. These are just a couple of physical ailments that I've run into in this business. And um, while I think it is true that butchery is a young man's game, I think that you can keep going as long as you take care of yourself. And while these just represent a couple of things on the physical side, there's we haven't yet talked about the mental aspect of health in the industry. And I think we will do that very soon in another episode. Thanks, meatheads. And until next time, take care. All right, it's Travis again. I was unaware that David had the diet of a Roman aristocrat. Because I think of gout as very old. I imagine David eating grapes, eating shellfish, eating decadent things, getting blown by a surf, someone with a pond frond, rubbing lamb suet over David's naturally hairy chest. Just imagine that. You're welcome for that imagery. One thing that I learned about uriatic crystals is that they form in the kidneys. And when my son was born, I was changing his diaper. We were still in the hospital at this point. It was like the first night. And I look in his diaper, and instead of being a pea color like I thought, it was, it was bright orange. And I was freaked out, and I hit the nurse call button, and they asked what was wrong, and I, they came in. And then I said, something's wrong, I don't know. And they said, oh, that's just uriatic crystals. That's just his uh, kidneys cleaning out. That's, that's normal. That happens from children time to time when they're first born. I think that's something that they should tell you to expect. Because it certainly did uh, freak me out. Hey, guys. Travis here. Just want to talk about how you could support our show is by supporting our sponsor, uh, Bunzel Processing Division. And they offer a wide variety of uh, disposables, everything from N95 mass disposable gloves, even uh, equipment like uh, Jarvis lines of captive bolts, uh, well saws, etc. They have a wide variety of cutlery. Their NX Pro series exclusive to Bunzel Processing Division is comparable to uh, butcher cutlery out there right now for significantly less price. It's exclusive to Bunzel. Steels are great. They have a seven and a half inch rough cut steel with a polished tip that I love. I use their polished steel on the slaughter truck. Their lamb skinner is the best lamb skinner I have used hands down. It's amazing. Please check out Bunzel Processor Division and the NX Pro Series Cutlery. That's BunzelPD.com. Once again, that's BunzelPD.com. But back to my story where I just got the job in Hollywood and I'm leaving Vermont. I arrived in September, late September, uh, moved back to California, and I moved in with my grandmother. Her name is Juanita Pafilia Lopez. And Grandma Nita was telling me how happy she was that I was a butcher and that she's so proud it's continuing in the family. And I had no idea what she was talking about. And then she goes on to tell me about her father, and he was kidnapped by... The Native Americans and doesn't know his lineage beyond that. But he ended up being a butcher and a mobile slaughterman with a horse drawn cart in the early part of the last century in San Jose, New Mexico. Now, unlike San Jose, California, the town of San Jose, New Mexico is very small. It is a, you know, a lot of people talk about one horse towns, but this is like a worn church town there's a central church one road that goes in loops around the church and goes out and up until recently uh our family had property there about 40 acres that he owned my great-grandfather and my grandmother and we i would go there you know a few times uh, when i was growing up and she would tell me that he would go out and kill beef and and sheep and not so many pigs because they there weren't that many in the area and he would 
dress them out, bring them back to uh, the house, package the meats, and do a lot of smoking because refrigeration wasn't that big in the area at the time. And when he was 90 years old, he went out and slaughtered a beef, cut it up, and packaged. And then later that evening, he had a heart attack at the age of 90, and it gave me hope. It was like, wow, I could, you know, work as hard, uh, that there's longevity in this. And I started working my first time in retail. The shop in Hollywood was receiving, you know, two beef carcasses a week, six pigs and eight lambs and 150 chickens. And to me, that was like a, that was half a day's worth of work. And I was smug and I was, I was arrogant and, more so than I am now. And I would apply, you know, techniques in, uh, from speed that I learned working in production and tried to streamline the process to, and I was met with great uh, apprehension by the owners and staff. I was on easy street that I thought. September rolled into October, which rolled into November. And then turkey season came around. And we received a truckload or a van load, a lot of turkeys, more turkeys than we had cold storage for. So we had to orchestrate our pickups within laser-like precision. Now, due to the fact that I was living with my grandma and Thanksgiving calls for long hours, my grandma, if I wasn't home by 10 o'clock, she would lock the door, put a chair underneath it, and I would be locked out. Uh, she also had my grandfather's old M1 grant uh, that I would also assume that she may shoot me if I tried to get uh, home after a unreasonable hour of 10.05. Now, this is because she lived in San Pedro, Wilmington, Harbor City area of Los Angeles most of her adult life and saw the city change from what it was in the uh, 50s to what it is or what it was in the 80s and 90s. It's much better now. It's the city where both my parents were born. So with the fear of being shot after working these long hours in the Thanksgiving season, I would get a hotel in West Hollywood, a Motel 6. And man, it was gross. Tom Baudet should have left the lights off. So if you've worked in a small retail shop during Thanksgiving, you, you may have had a similar experience. No, well, not staying in a Motel 6 or uh, dealing with Grandma Anita, but I would, I would be there until about 2 to 3 in the morning. And then uh, you were expected to be there before the shop opened, and it was all hands on deck. I would return to the Motel 6, and even though I had paid parking, sometimes a lot would fill up, and then I would have to drive back to my work, which was a few blocks away, and then walk back to the Motel 6. My diet at the time consisted of Rockstar energy drinks and camels. I ditched the chew because I realized that was not going to fly in the city of Los Angeles. I was used to the physical work, and I was used to the long hours. But what I was not used to was the keeping track of information and dealing directly with the customer. You have very intense people, and rightfully so. All these people are coming to you to make their meal special. They're buying the center point, what their family is going to look at and what they're going to gather around. Essentially, the conocopia is your responsibility. So you're dealing with them at their most stressed, at one of the most stressed times of the year. And they're stressed because they're going to see their family. They're stressed because they got to make this perfect meal. And they don't give a fuck about you. My bosses at the time said I could stay at their house. And so one day I was getting ready and then they kind of took that back. And they left and didn't invite me. So I went online and rebooked a night at the Motel 6. That is now four nights in a row. Working with little to no sleep. You can't take an Ambien because it has an eight hour effect. So you're just oh, hope you could fall asleep in that three hour time frame stressing that like oh the owners don't like me they kind of 
took back me staying at their house. Uh, everyone is, this sucks. All my insecurities are keeping me up. I'm in this new city, only for two months, living with Grandma Nita, who I think is going to shoot me if I come home at 10.05 and I go to work several rock stars, chain smoke. And then I get this pain in my chest and I take a seat and I'm breathing heavily and I have severe angina. My heart can't keep up uh, pumping the oxygen or circulating the oxygen that my body needs. I haven't felt like this since I had cocaine psychosis in my early 20s and that is a totally other story. One that I may tell when I talk about substance abuse in this industry, but we're talking about physical health. I'm sitting in the back hallway of the shop like a service area, and the girl who was working the counter and doing some of the bookkeeping at the time comes out and pretty much berates me. Says all you ever do is feel sorry for yourself, how your life sucks. You're in the position to change it. You're the one who's living off of rock stars and smoking two packs a day. And I express how, well, it's the holidays and they need me. And she says, yeah, they may, you know, look down at you if you don't show up or if you uh, sleep in or something. But your, your health is more important than this shitty job. And the reason people don't like you is because you're off-putting with your overworth ethic. That it's always a competition. She gave me some aspirin and a glass of water. And kind of told me that I needed to get my shit together. The pain in my chest went away. Thanksgiving was over. Now, Christmas is right around the corner. But before I get there, this next piece is by Ryan. This week we're talking about health in our meat industry. Physical health and mental health are very closely related. First, I'd like to address this topic that physical laborers and tradesmen are somehow healthier. There's this myth I hear a lot from people in the tech industry or uh, urban folks um, who I have a lot of urban friends, a lot of city friends. I love city people. I also love rural people um, and um, small town people and big town people. I'm, I can relate to the big town folks. Uh, because that's where I grew up, but I also really relate to the rural folks because that's the place, the circumstance where I've decided to live in my entire adult life. Um, so let me just say from a lot of my, uh, you know, urban friends or, or, or office worker friends or people in my life from cities who maybe begin to dabble in gardening or farming in some way, shape or form. They often like to say, man, who needs a gym? People should just work outside or do labor jobs. And I've heard that so many times now. And I just want to nip it in the butt and um, say humans certainly benefit from a dose of physical labor work and fresh air. Certainly. But in the the gym training is way invaluable too. If you've ever spent time among people who do Physical labor professions, they are not the picture of health. In many in many places where I've worked in different labor industries, from farming, agriculture, did some landscaping, commercial fishing, and the meat industry, these folks are across the board not the picture of health. Overuse injuries and chronic pain are very, very common occurrences. Now, don't get me wrong. Let me backtrack. I I am a huge advocate for people to get off the couch and be very, very active. I think it's only right for humans to be active. I'd like to see a lot more people in the trades, working with their bodies, learning how to work with their bodies, learning how to work hard. Really, we should provide that experience for our children um, as part of their education, that they learn how to work hard with their body out of doors. It can be very, very good for our bodies and souls to do labor work. But getting out and learning to work with your hands and your body is just the beginning of the conversation. How to be healthy and balanced physical laborers over the long haul? That is the real question. 
Okay, at the outset here with this here meat block recording segment, I'm going to talk about health in the meat industry in a very general sense. Then I'll hone in on the specifics that pertain to each job circumstance we may find ourselves in. Okay, so the demands of meat industry careers in many instances are not too different from the demands of other physical labor professions. Commercial fishermen do the same kind of dance on slippery decks, slippery floors, as they're picking salmon from a gill net over and over and over and over and over. Or baiting and setting a lobster pot or crab pot hundreds of times per day. The same kind of dance as a retail butcher on a busy morning in a high-volume shop. Meat cutters become very efficient and mechanical. Especially as volume goes up, they become more efficient and more mechanical. Traveling back and forth from the cooler to the cutting block, cooler to the cutting block, tearing open boxes of subprimals with no wasted motion, portioning steaks in one sweeping movement and quickly moving on to the next box. The pace can be very similar. The loads can be very similar. The repetition can be similar to other trades and other skilled labor jobs. I said to my friend John, who's a gillnet salmon fisherman, how would you describe the typical body type of a commercial fisherman? He thought about it and responded, Strong back, skinny legs, and a low pot belly. I laughed and I realized that's a pretty similar description, pretty similar body type to what I see in the butchering world. The only difference being that butchers might be a little bit more, or maybe a lot more, asymmetrical to the fishermen because of heavier demands on our cutting arm. Kind of a little bit more one-arm dominant of a career. Meat cutters in the production cutting custom and USDA niches are constantly moving all day long, never pausing to sit down except for a break time. They're at the rail on the block, and we're forever pushing and pulling with our arms, bending, leaning, twisting our torsos, shuffling our feet in a strange, repetitive circle across a five a five foot length of floor space, or maybe a three foot little square area that we stay in all day long, kind of shuffling. Uh, back and forth there. If we're helping at the grinder or if we're throwing freight for a, a retail shop, we might be throwing around dozens of 50-pound luggers every hour, luggers filled with trim or grind or cuts or sausage. All this leads to strong backs or sometimes hurt backs, skinny legs, high-calorie food intake habits after your shift is over, and sometimes a little pot belly, especially as butchers get into midlife and their metabolism slow down and they begin having their young apprentices do more of the heavy lifting around the shop. Fishermen like to joke with each other that you need a strong back and a weak mind to be in their line of work. Butchers talk about a strong back, a weak mind, and a sharp knife. But I digress. Let me get back on track here. The demands of working in the trades can be similar, whether you're in construction, carpentry, landscaping, agriculture, electrical, plumbing, slaughter work, or meat cutting. Every trade has a gross motor skill demand and a fine motor skill demand. Depending on what niche we're in, we will spend a different amount of time under load in a gross motor way or a fine motor way. Different percentage of time allotted to either gross motor or fine motor activities. Gross motor would be heavy, big, heavy, full body movements, bigger energy expenditure, but less skill comparatively. Whereas fine motor would be higher skill, much higher skill movement requiring precision, accuracy, balance, coordination. If we take an object uh, if we take an objective look at the movements we inhabit through the course of our day, we can get a rough estimate of what percent of our time we spend dominated by gross motor or fine motor. And this awareness is a very important one in physical labor jobs and even in athletic training or in life in general. It's a very important awareness to have. What are we doing? What are we demanding from our body and where are the loads because the amount of time and load we are asking our bodies to endure will require different recovery strategies. 
if we're not consciously working on smart recovery strategies, then we're leaving it to chance whether we'll have any longevity in our careers. Ultimately, there are many factors that are out of our control that will determine whether our bodies can adapt to our workloads over time. There's many factors that are out of our control, but there are certainly factors that are within our control that are worth exploring to see if they help. So what are these low-hanging fruit that we can try? First, we must build knowledge of the specific types of loads and stressors that we are experiencing in our unique job situations. I, I just, I'm being redundant, but we have to build that awareness of what we are doing. If I'm an assembly line beef boner, I'm going to be doing fine motor work all day long. Precision knife work is a high skill activity. If I'm ro- on, on the other hand, if I'm rolling gut barrels all day or throwing heavy loads throughout my day, you know, a lot of bending, a lot of lifting, then I'll be burning more calories with gross motor movements. So we have to break things into these categories to understand how they're impacting us. We also have a firm we also must have a firm grasp on what the risks and common injuries are that are common among people who are in similar job situations. To understand what risks and what recovery strategies are at play, we have to think about variance and repetition. Am I performing varied movements throughout my day, or am I repeating the same movements over and over? Very important to think about that. When performing gross motor movements such as bending, squatting, climbing, and lifting, we have the possibility of injury if we are not using our using sound body mechanics. We can get hurt from lifting incorrectly, twisting incorrectly, or slipping and falling, just to name a few possibilities. A study should be made of what proper body mechanics are to move loads safely. And a practice should be made of continually striving to improve one's posture and body mechanics to avoid unnecessary wear and tear on the body. This is a lifelong practice. Gymnastics, barbell training, and yoga under a good coach are examples of practices that can help you move safer at work. So that may have been, I don't know if I was clear there, but what I'm trying to say is, that if you're doing a lot of gross motor movements, um, the main risk with the gross motor movements is incorrect form and poor body mechanics. And and those are the things that are going to uh, open you up to in- injury. Okay, if you're lifting heavy loads over and over all day long and you're using poor body mechanics, your back's rounded and, and such, and you're not lifting with the larger muscle groups of your body, um, then you're going to open yourself up to the injury. That's that's one of the risks associated with that. And to mitigate that, we can make a lifelong study of what is the safe and proper movement and body mechanics to handle these loads safely and mitigate our risks. So that's the gross mo- mo- motor category. Okay, now moving on to uh, fine motor. The risks associated with repetitive Fine motor work are more in the category of overuse injuries, carpal tunnel, tendonitis, and other inflammation-based debilitating conditions. How to prevent overuse injuries can seem like a very daunting and confusing task, especially if we're working in a niche that requires us to do repetitive work, like assembly line Work is very repetitive. I knew some folks who did their entire careers in a candy factory, right? And so they're wrapping these pieces of candy over and over. The and um, the you know carpal tunnel is is huge. Baristas get a lot of carpal tunnel. There's many, many, many instances of just basic repetitive work that causes carpal tunnel tendonitis, and and high inflammation conditions. My first suggestion here is to move away from repetition as much as possible. 
That's kind of a no-brainer. Try to mix things up as much as possible. Vary what you're doing as much as possible. Swap duties with a coworker who is doing something slightly different from you. That'll help. My second suggestion is to look to wisdom from the professional sports community and sports recovery techniques. Many, many, many sports are dominated by high skill movements that an athlete must repeat over and over and over for years. A basketball player has to pivot and jump endlessly. A tennis player has to repeat the same swing motions a bazillion times. A baseball pitcher has to throw with the same arm in the same way, and the performance depends on mitigating pain and overuse injuries. So this category of fine motor, um, dominated professions, we can we can take uh, uh, some of the tips from the sports community. Okay, so back to my first suggestion. If you can vary things, do that first. I hold a knife and cut with my strong arm, but I clean and scrub with my non-dominant arm to distribute the load. Also, outside of work, I try to use my non-dominant arm as much as I can because I know that while at work, I have no choice but to cut with my dominant arm. At one time, I did try to teach myself to cut with my non-dominant arm, but I ended up stabbing myself with my boning knife in my, in my other arm. So that was, that was horrible. If you can teach yourself, if you can teach yourself to use both hands to cut without stabbing yourself like I did, it would probably be worth it. I know that on the slaughter truck, both the guys I work with on the slaughter truck can cut, uh, um, can side beef with with either hand, or or especially when it comes to um, skinning pigs, they're doing that with both their right hand and their left hand. So, so it can be done. These guys, uh, and it's really smart if you can do that, if you're ambidextrous in that way. Um, I happen to have a bad experience because I stabbed myself pretty bad. Uh, and it kind of scared me off trying to use my non-dominant arm, but I, I certainly think it's smart if you can figure out how to do that in a safe way. Also, I like to, so what I do do with carcass breaking is I like to vary my carcass breaking technique. If I find myself throughout the day or the week, um, really getting stale and overworked with one way of boning a hindquarter, for example, it makes sense to me to then switch to another way of breaking that hindquarter that is demanding in a slightly different way just to mix things up. It's kind of like a way for me to help me catch my breath, so to speak, or to recover and not burn out on only one way of doing things. Just having some different tools in my toolbox that I can kind of switch between that put a slightly different demand on my body is really, really helpful for me. Switching back and forth, working at the rail, and then switching to working on the table more has also been really helpful for me. I feel like rail work um, rail work demands a lot from my lats and can be kind of hard on my shoulders, but it's way easier on my back and my post and i can i can really maintain decent posture while i'm working at the rail whereas table work is easier on my shoulders but it puts me into a hunched position a hunched posture that after many many hours becomes uncomfortable for my neck and my back um the more I, whereas the more i can switch back and forth between okay let's do some table work okay let's do some rail work uh, I'm, I feel less oppressed by the drawbacks of either situation. It seems I can keep myself fresher and work more comfortably by varying things and mixing things up in creative ways like this. Okay, and if we can't switch things up or vary things enough, if we find ourselves suffering from an overuse injury, we okay, firstly seek professional help. But secondly, try some 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 recovery strategies that are out there from the sports world. When my tendonitis flares up or when my cutting arm is particularly uncomfortable during the busy season, I first and foremost know that eating well and sleeping well is going to make the biggest difference. Sleep is an incredibly effective anti-inflammatory strategy. Secondly, when I'm really hurting, I might do a contrast therapy ice bath on my arm in the evening. 
I learned this particular technique from gymnastics coach Chris for summer who learned it because it was a technique that one of Michael Jordan's physical therapists would use on him when his Achilles heel, his Achilles tendon was acting up during game season. For the contrast therapy ice session, I'll, I'll fill a five gallon bucket with ice water, heavy on the ice, ice water. And then I'll have another bucket with just room temperature water, not hot water, just room temperature water. And I, I'm going to be going back and forth between the two, but the ice is shocking enough for your body. And all you need is, is then room temperature water to allow your body to come back to a baseline so that the ice will be effective again the next time you dunk into the ice during the next round. As for the time protocol, I'll do five minutes with my arm submerged in ice water and then five immediately followed by five minutes with my arm in room temperature water and immediately back to the ice, back and forth, back and forth. I'll repeat this for an hour. So that's, I just lifted that straight from Coach Christopher Summer who lifted it straight from this Michael Jordan protocol. It's surprisingly effective. Uh, apparently it helped, it really helped Michael Jordan bounce back when he... Um, needed to calm inflammation and keep that inflammation at bay so he could perform it at game time. Um, over the years, I have hired many physical therapists and tried many um, physical therapy techniques. I've gone through periods where I was very rigorous about stretching mobility and strengthening weak or underutilized kind of atrophied muscles of the forearm and shoulder in an effort to keep my Cutting arm bulletproof, but in the end, it was it has you know for me it's been the proper sleep and hydration and nutrition, and then the variance in the workplace that has helped me the most significantly. Rehab exercises are great, and if you find a therapeutic one that works for you, keep doing it. For a back injury I developed six years ago, it wasn't until I found a certain set of corrective exercises from the PRI, which is the Postural Restoration Institute, that I finally was able to come out of pain. So what I'm saying is corrective exercises can be very, very valuable in certain circumstances. But these days I find if I'm eating and sleeping well, my cutting arm tends to feel better. If I'm able to get in the gym a few days a week, also I end up feeling better. It doesn't seem to matter what I do in the gym as long as it as as long as I load my body with something strenuous that is dissimilar enough from the the strenuous uh from the load that I experience at work um then then uh the the whole experience ends up being therapeutic um so I don't go I I got to make sure not to go into the gym and irritate my tendonitis which, uh, because that's what I do at work all day long. So I do something that's sort of like complementary to the loads I'm experiencing in the workplace. And I will work up a sweat with it. Um, this gym habit is, ends up being incredibly therapeutic for me also. I hope people find these suggestions useful. Bodies and injuries are highly individual and it takes a lot of experimenting and persistence and trial and error to figure out what things work effectively for you. So I hope you've, uh, you know, so it's good to talk about it and it's good to bring some light on what works for certain people. And, and, uh, and then we can, all, we can all try it. I'm going to keep, you know, it's a lifelong thing. So, all right. Take care until next time. All right. Travis again. Thanks, Ryan, for that segment. A lot of good advice in there. Some things to do as far as prevention is get yourself like a rubber band or hand putty. You can pick up hand putty, I believe, at most pharmacists. And what you're going to do with that is going to wrap it around all your fingers. Like, take all your fingers on your hand, make them into a point like you're doing, you know, like the pray, praying mantis shit or, or, or something like that. You know, make them all touch each other. And then put that rubber band or put that hand putty around your fingers and you're going to stretch out your fingers. And what that's going to do is, because you're holding a knife, you're 
gripping. All your muscles and tendons are working in one direction, but they never work in the other direction. You need to balance it out. When I was going to physical therapy, uh, I was told this after, uh, you know, I, I had multiple boxer fractures and I lost my index finger for, you know, half a day. Um, and these are the exercises that my physical therapist told me that would help with my carpal tunnel. So back to my story. I survived the holidays and I made the decision that retail wasn't for me. So I decided to go back into processing. But after taking that year break and going back to working those long, repetitive days, the carpal tunnel tendonitis came back. Also, I got Achilles tendonitis, which is tendonitis in your Achilles tendon. And it is probably some of the worst pain I've ever felt. And I still have that from time to time. Get yourself some good inserts. Now, I was working for a new company, just helped them get online. Uh, their USDA plant online in San Diego. And my life was, was moving fast. That girl who worked the counter at my last job, we were now together and we were expecting. She had since left that job and I was uh, the only one working. I was making good money. We were looking at places to move. We were living in West LA at the time and I was still commuting. Or I was commuting to San Diego, which is a terrible commute. And this is in uh, February, and you know, one of our favorite football teams just made it into the Super Bowl. It was the, if you remember, Seahawks Patriots Super Bowl. And in that two week period when they won the champion and were championship and waiting for the game to start, my company told me that their numbers aren't doing as well and their growth isn't projecting, so they wanted to reevaluate my contract. They wanted to cut production from five days to three days, convert my salary to hourly, hourly, and we were going to see how this looked at the end of the month. Seattle lost the Super Bowl, and my wife had a miscarriage. These things happen. It could have been just natural or could have been from the stress of uncertainty with my career, but it sucked. Um, I held a lot of resentment towards that company because of that, maybe unfairly. Knowing that we wouldn't be able to support ourselves off of these reduced hours, my wife not in the position to find work not that she wasn't in the position to work. Uh, absolutely, uh, she would easily have been able to find a job. But what was going to happen is my salary was going to be reduced uh, and we weren't going to be able to cover our living expenses in the, in the time frame that, you know, like most Americans, that we were the working poor, that we were, you know, even though I was making good money supporting two people living in Southern California, that by any means that if something happened to a paycheck that would affect our, our, our finances that like we didn't, most Americans don't have savings and people who were our age at the time certainly didn't have much savings. So I needed to relocate. We know we were going to, we we're looking at places where we could, you know, be close to family because when you relocate, it's good to help have someone or have family there to help you adjust during the transitional period, such as Grandma Juanita, or Grandma Anita did for me. So I was looking at Sacramento, where my parents live, looking back in Vermont, where my brother lives, uh, looking up in the Bay Area, where my other brother lives, got, you know, several offers, and then, you know, looking up where her family lives up in the great state of Washington, where I am now. And I was offered an amazing job that I took, running a USDA mobile slaughter truck in building a processing facility where I'd come up with the plans, the CAD plans, and then they were going to build this, uh, I think it was $750,000 uh, USDA added value whole carcass processor. And this all happened in the span of, of about two weeks. The day my wife had her miscarriage, the next day I 
told the owners of the company I was in San Diego that I would no longer be returning to work. Later that week, I was in Washington and visiting this facility. And the following week, we were packing up a U-Haul from and driving from Los Angeles up to Washington. And this is where my new health uh, situation happened. And it wasn't physical. It, w- it was mental. It, it was myself. I, I, I was suffering from like a form of imposter syndrome and just severe anxiety that, you know, I've, I've always want to say that I've done well. Um, but at this point, you know, my experience in San Diego, I haven't had something like that really. And it sucked. It was embarrassing. It kept me up at night. And I would think like, can I, can I do this? Are you, are you as good as you think you are? And I know I have so much more to learn. I'd see people online and I'd see all this other shit. And I, I'd be like, well, I don't know if I could do that. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, it's just, I don't, I can't describe it. It's just like a feeling of just like I'm going to be found out. Maybe it was the Washington weather, but I start, you know, thinking I was slipping back into depressive episodes. And then some days I'd have so much energy. And when I was uh, 25, I was diagnosed with bipolar and I hadn't had a manic incident in, in several years. And when I mean like bipolar, I don't mean like I get mood swings and and that stuff. I meant like I I stayed in a hospital for uh, two weeks because of a manic episode. It was terrible times. I was able to adjust my life and and I hadn't taken meds in in a long time, but I felt like I needed to with a combination of work and stress and hadn't seen a doctor in several years. And I made an appointment and my doctor was like, how, what brings you in today? How are you feeling? Just general questions and I think she got those out and I talked for the next you know 45 minutes without taking a breath and that's what I needed was just to just get all this out now what's the point of this whole story well in the beginning I was saying that I came up in the industry where you were more or less shamed if you bitched about how you felt and how much pain you're in Uh, physically and now in society we live in a time where people are kind of ashamed of having mental health issues and not talking that people you know I get offended when the reason I don't talk about you know being bipolar or having terrible situational anxiety is because I don't want it to be speculated for anything that I do or choose to do you know, it's not like if I'm a dick, if someone's like, oh, you're just being, you know, you're manic or whatever, that it doesn't work like that. Um, which allows me to internalize it and not talk about it. I even have issues talking about it with with my wife now. And, you know, we're, we're happy, we have great communication, but it's my own insecurity. Uh, we have a beautiful son together. We have... A, a life that I couldn't be happier about, but I still find that it's hard to bring up. I find it easier telling you, the anonymous listener who I've never met, uh, than it is talking about it in person to anyone. So if you're overworked, overtired, or in pain, physically or mentally take a break give yourself a health check see a doctor talk fuck it talk to me because i'm only 35 or 34 and my great-grandfather died at the age of 90 doing the way i was working earlier in my career that certainly wouldn't have been a possibility for me